The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. I want to wish you a very warm welcome to this 15th edition of EVPA's policy webinar series. Today's webinar is about incubators and accelerators bridging the gap for new impact ventures in Europe. My name is Luis Fonseca. I'm a managing partner at Maze, an impact investment company, and I will host you in today's session. Before we start, a few technical notes regarding the webinar. The GoToWebinar application allows you to access the webinar via your computer or your phone. Throughout the webinar, you'll be able to open or hide the GoToWebinar control panel. A note that the control panel automatically collapses when it's not used, but you can bring it back using the orange arrow on the left. In the Join Audio section of the control panel, you should tick the option Microphone and Speakers if you are joining the webinar through internet. If you would like to dial using the phone, choose Telephone and provide the PIN code that you received when you registered for this webinar. The PIN code can also be seen here on the slide starting by 726. If you happen to have any technical issues, just call EVPA and get in touch with Gianluca. Here's the number on the slide, on the bottom part. During the webinar, you'll be able to raise your questions and feedback in the chat window through the question section, okay? The last part of today's webinar will consist of an interactive Q&A session during which we will address your questions to the panelists. If you would like to ask a question to a specific speaker, please make sure to include whom you're addressing the question to when you write it down. In the case we cannot answer all of the questions, feel free to contact us via email and we will follow up. Finally, the session will be recorded and uploaded to EVPA's website in due time. Now, before we dive into the topic of today, I'd just like to spend a minute or so to introduce EVPA, uh, European Venture Philanthropy Association. EVPA is a membership organization currently gathering more than 280 members from across Europe that are interested or active in the field of venture philanthropy and social investment. The members include foundations, social investors, financial institutions, academics, as well as service providers. One of the VPA's objectives within their mission to build a well-functioning and cohesive ecosystem for social investment and innovation is to foster conducive policy environments, both at an European and the national level. So there are two main pillars. First, in the role of a thought leader, if EPA acts as a counterpart for the institutions of the EU by being the voice of the sector, communicating the concerns and expectations of our members to European policymakers. This helps lead the discussion and shape the debate, and EVP also spots and discusses key topics of interest to our sector, including relevant initiatives undertaken by the European Union. Second, in the role of a catalyst, EVPA brings together different actors in conversation in order to increase mutual understanding, shared value and impact. This is done through initiatives that tap into the synergies between public and private sectors and by showcasing best policy practices and inspirational stories. So in a nutshell, what VPA aims to do is to inform and initiate interactions, but to some extent also inspire all the actors. One of EVPA's projects um, at the Policy and Public Affairs Department is the EU webinar series. This started in mid-2014 and has already reached more than a thousand people. As you can see from the list, previous webinars have addressed issues such as outcome funds, regulation for social investment funds and others. 
All of these webinars are published on EVPA's website and readily available if you happen to be interested in them. At the end of the webinar today, a quick survey will pop up on your screen. We would really appreciate if you just take a minute to share your feedback to today's session and leave any suggestions for future webinar topics. So, kicking off today's topic, we will start with a short introduction on the topic, on a few key, key concepts um, and ideas by me. Then we'll have three great speakers that will I will introduce in a few minutes. They will each be sharing in 10 minutes specific initiatives they've been involved in and their perspective on the topic. As said before, after that, we will have the Q&A moment. Feel free to write the questions on the chat window at any moment of the session, but we should only address these questions after making sure we can hear from all of our speakers. We expect the session to end around 4, 30, 4, 45 CT time. So uh, starting on the next slide with the key objectives of the session, the first objective is to discuss the importance of supporting early stage social innovation. The second will be to highlight the importance of creating the right policy incentives and finally, we'll be doing this by showcasing real success stories to be shared by our speakers. On the next slide, what we've tried to do here is to help differentiate the two concepts of accelerator and incubator, which are many times used interchangeably. The reason why these concepts are used like that is because they do, in fact, overlap in some areas. But we've tried to define here four dimensions that can help you distinguish one from the other. Purpose, duration, application process, and type of support provider. In any case, if we had to choose one word to describe how these two differ, I would say that incubator equals a space and accelerator equals a program. Hopefully this will become more clear as we go along the session. So let's start with purpose here. Typical incubators are more aimed at earlier stage ventures, while accelerators are typically aimed at scale and growth ventures. This is not always the case though, but this is what we usually see. Now, in terms of duration, incubators work on an open-ended timeline after being like a long-term process, but accelerators, on the other hand, they work within a set time frame. Typically, these programs are between anywhere from three to six months. Regarding the application process, incubators tend to be open to anyone who can afford it and meets the eligibility criteria, pretty much as in a co-working space and with a focus on local ventures, while accelerators typically have a demanding selection process with only a few ventures being able to enter the program. And many, many times we're talking here ventures with international profile. We'll see next when our speakers present that some of these programs can be incredibly competitive to enter. Lastly, in terms of the type of support provided, incubators tend to focus on co-working space and some mentoring, while accelerators go beyond that to offer training models, workshops, close contact with investors, introductions to corporates, etc. This is just to give you an idea of how these two concepts that are closely related still do share um, some differences. Now on the next slide, what we'll do is looking at the role of incubators and accelerators in the ecosystem. And if we were to say this in a sentence, basically what incubators and accelerators are trying to do is to help impact ventures move forward in their life cycle. Let's say that impact ventures have four stages, from stage one, uh, when we're talking about blueprint ideation, to stage two, which is more about validating your idea in terms of product market fit, then you can be standardizing your product, get ready basically to get to stage four, where, where you would be scaled. Now, what we see in most ecosystems is that there is abundant support at stage one 
blueprint and ideation. However, as impact ventures try to move forward, many end up in what is called the death valley and are unable to develop further or even cease existing. The support that incubators and accelerators give, what we said before, mentoring, workshops, training, contact with investors, etc., are thus, in essence, trying to help impact ventures having a better chance of surviving, growing, and scaling. Now, from a policy perspective, this is very relevant because many times the focus from policymakers is in providing incentives for capital to be deployed into these ventures. However, for this, the capital to be deployed, obviously, we need to have enough impact ventures. So, incubators and accelerators have this critical role in creating a stronger, what is usually called pipeline, of these ventures that can receive the capital and then become successful. On the next slide, what we'll see is a quickly overview of, of some of the key, key elements of an accelerator program. As said before, accelerator and incubator are not necessarily the same, but an accelerator program tends to be slightly more complex. So we thought it would be interesting to just give you a general sense of the key elements of an acceleration program. So the first element to consider is the business model. And this is super relevant because an accelerator is very resource intensive. And it's really important to understand how it can be funded. The first possibility is sponsoring. So um, this is typically done by corporates who look at an acceleration program as a way to bring innovation in-house, Let's say I'm a real estate uh, corporation. I want to have more contact with ventures or startups. I, I sponsor an acceleration program and I get in close contact with them and be able to take their innovation back into my business. This sponsoring is many times done via corporates, but obviously it can be done via foundations, other entities. Ultimately, this can take the form of a grant and we'll be looking into specific programs that can help us get there. The second uh, business model that we see um, being very common is, let's call it equity. So basically, it's very common for accelerators to ask ventures for equity or a stake in the camp in the, in the, of the venture in exchange for participating in the program. So let's say a venture to participate in acceleration program gets um, 50,000 euros and gives back 5% of the company to the accelerator program. The way this works is that then accelerators expect to be able to sell those stakes a few years down the line and get a financial return from it. Finally, what we have many times uh, close to acceleration programs are funds. So we see funds that are closely connected to acceleration programs and the two work in synergy with the fund partially funding some of the ventures. Maybe let's say if the acceleration program initially takes 5%, the fund goes on and makes a bigger investment and the two obviously work in close synergy. So these are the typical business models that we see um, in terms of acceleration programs. The, the second element is the focus of the program. This is much easier to understand. What we typically see is that programs either fit into a generalist or specific uh, type of program. So generalists, they take any type of ventures, specific focus on specific areas, such as technology, mobility, even impact can be considered itself as a specific vertical. That's the common uh, word choice to be used for an acceleration program. Regarding the stage, as said before, while we see accelerators that work with both early and growth stage ideas, they are typically more focused on growth stage ideas. Lastly, some of the key features of an acceleration are the duration. As said before, they tend to be three months long. They tend to have cohorts of around 10 ventures, so typically working with a limited amount of ventures and running about two cohorts per year. So in a typical program, we would see, uh, we would work between 10 and 20 ventures per year. 
So this was just to give you a, an overview. Before moving on and passing the floor to our speakers, there's one last slide that we wanted to share with you on some sample of policy instruments that are designed to support incubation and acceleration. The first one is easy. So this is the Employment and Social Innovation Programme, a financing instrument that is managed by the European Commission and that is running until 2020. Now, strand D of the programme focuses on development of investment readiness support for social enterprises, namely through generating a pipeline of social enterprises prepared to access finance and growth. So what we were saying before is the role in the ecosystem. In fact, we as MAIS have our first acceleration program funded through this instrument. So we think it's worth exploring if you are seriously considering doing such a program. The second instrument is FSI Equity. This stands for European Fund for Strategic Investment Equity. Basically, this is supporting social impact investors to provide capital to these enterprises. In, in practical terms, what this means is that, for example, if you want to establish an uh, acceleration program and you want to opt to have a fund, a venture capital fund that is linked to that program, and if your aim is to have a pool of 3 million euros of investment, if you go to this program and su successfully apply, you might get the program to sponsor one and a half million euros, so up until 50% of the total amount. Again, as males, we have our own impact fund of 40 million euros, of which half 50% comes from this program. So again, we, we really think it's worth exploring this program to its full extent. Now, finally, uh, to conclude, we have InvestEU, Basically, this will bring together under one roof all the EU financial instruments that are currently, currently available. It's not running yet. It will run between 2021 and 2027. But what we know already is that one of the four main pillars of the proposal will be on social investment and skills and will have 4 billion euros in total. But still many details to be discussed and clarified. So finally, we move on to the best part of the webinar. We have invited three great speakers. Uh, our first guest speaker is Lorenzo Triboli. I have no idea if I'm saying his name correctly. I don't know how many Italians are here on the webinar. Uh, but after his experience as a management consultant at the Boston Consulting Group, Lorenzo has moved to the impact investing sector as financial analyst at Fondazione Housing Social, the main technical social and financial advisor to the Italian integrated system of social housing funds. With over 3 billion euros in committed capital, the SIF is one of the main impact investing programs worldwide. Our next speaker is Jessica Stacy. Jessica is a venture part partner at Bethnal Green Ventures where she provides business support and mentoring to early stage startups that are tackling social and environmental problems. She also supports the Best New Green Ventures investment team with evaluating investment opportunities at both the accelerator and seed stage. Finally, we have Peter Lawrence, which is part of the investment team at the Catapult Accelerator, advising both the program funds and the follow-on funds. He has a background in private equity at FSN Capital and in a virtual reality startup called Dimension 10. He is passionate about investing in businesses, doing for good, and believe, like I guess we all do here, that the grand challenges the world faces also are great economic opportunities here. So Lorenzo, so Jessica, Peter, thank you very much for taking the time today. A very warm welcome again on the behalf of EVPA. We hope that inviting these guest speakers sparks a fruitful discussion between the European institutions and practitioners on the ground. I suggest we get right into it. 
But lastly, as mentioned before, we'll have a Q&A slot after hearing each of our speakers. Just feel free to write your questions along the way, but know in advance that we should only address them after hearing from all the speakers. So, Lorenzo, I guess the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much again. Okay, thank you. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me well. Um, so, uh, today I have 10 minutes to tell you a bit more about Carico Social Innovation, which is uh, a program uh, entirely founded by Fondazione Carico, which is one of the biggest banking foundations in, in Europe. Carbo Social Innovation is an integrated strategy to support the growth and uh, the creation of an impact investing ecosystem in Italy. Uh, in order to do this, uh, the, the team has developed an integrated strategy with a 20 million euros endowment uh, dedicated to three main lines of actions that tackle both the demand side and the supply side of the Italian impact investing market. Uh, so, uh, the first one is a capacity building measure, uh, meaning it's uh, on, the, on the demand side. The second one is an impact investing measure, so the creation of an, of an impact investing vehicle dedicated to fostering uh, the, the supply of patient capital in Italy. And finally, the third measure is uh, uh, it's called Get It and aims at uh, um, uh, providing uh, uh, investment readiness programs to new social startups. So, uh, a bit, uh, some, a few more words about the capacity building measure. Uh, so, uh, next slide, please. Um, this measure is uh, entirely managed within a team in uh, Fondazione Cariplo and uh, is basically consists in a call for grants entirely dedicated to strictly non-profit organizations which are historically the, the, the main focus of Fondazione Cariplo. Uh, so uh, what these uh, call for grants, grants aims to do is to uh, supply grants from 30k up to 100k to uh, non-profit organizations uh, uh, who are uh, starting to do uh, internal process of organizational empowerment, leadership, or generation, generation, generational change, and internationalization. So basically, they uh, prepare a business plan of how they intend to strengthen their organization in this way, uh, and the team within Carlo reviews this and can decide to finance this with a grant. Hopefully, uh, this measure will be able, with uh, a few additions of this grant, to, uh, to let some of these uh, strictly non-profit organizations to become sustainable in the long run. So meaning uh, some of them will be able to have a, a constant uh, uh, flow of revenues that can make some of these interesting for uh, venture capitalists or social impact investors. Um, also, we have supporting measures such as uh, a, a lab. You can see here socialinnovationlab.fondazionecarlo.it, which is uh, a, a series of webinars dedicated to social innovation, social entrepreneurship, and sustainability, uh, which is free for everybody, but it's mandatory for the people who win the call for grants. So the next slide, please. Um, second. Secondly, uh, we have the Fondazione Social Venture Giordano dell'Amore. So uh, this is a new foundation, basically a vehicle, an investing vehicle uh, that was born in uh, 2017 with an initial endowment of 8.5 million. Uh, it's kind of a pilot project uh, that aims at uh, developing an impact investing culture in Italy. Uh, because uh, I have some additional slides in, uh, in backup, so maybe there is time with questions to talk about what is the state of the art of the impact investing supply in Italy. But it's not really rich right now. Uh, so what the foundation does is uh, uh, two things, direct and indirect investments. Uh, so meaning uh, uh, providing uh, uh, equity to uh, other social impact investment funds that want to come into the 
Italian market, but also directly to uh, impact ventures. How we do it? Uh, we do it with an impact first approach. Uh, so we are uh, uh, targeting companies that uh, seek impact intentionally, meaning that impact is strictly connected to the business model. The foundation, sorry, uh, is uh, operates as uh, kind of uh, as an uh, a venture capital fund, a social venture capital fund. So we are uh, are seeking to buy small shares of equity or sometimes quasi equity instruments of uh, uh, different kinds of uh, impact ventures uh, and accompany them to growth uh, for uh, a range of time from seven to 10 years. And then we are uh, seeking to sell the participation in order to cash in on the, on the investment and put together, put, put back to work this capital. Uh, we are not really targeting market uh, market returns, so the foundation also does uh, uh, advisory services to social startups or, or also to other social impact funds who want to try and do their impact fund in Italy. So if you can go to the next slide, slide please. Okay, so this is a bit of our investment strategy. So uh, in the, on the upper side of the slide, you can see indirect investments. So for example, we have invested 1, mi one uh, million euro uh, in Ultra Venture, which is uh, the first uh, uh, social impact fund to, to be born in Italy. Uh, but also we have direct and co-investments, so in the lower side of the slide. Uh, I really like to point out here that uh, uh, we can invest in socially driven companies regardless of their legal form. That is at least what we try to do. So, for example, as I said, with the capacity building measure. Okay, uh, we're hearing you again. Yeah, you do you hear me? Yeah, I'm sorry about the connection. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, we are hearing you again. You're back again. We lost the last 30 seconds. So uh, we are hearing oh, you again. Okay, okay, sorry about this. Uh, so, I was saying indirect investments. So, the first uh, uh, investment we made is in Ultra Venture, which is uh, probably the first impact investing fund in Italy to be operating. Uh, and secondly, uh, direct investments or co investments in socially driven companies. It is important to point out that we can do this regardless of the legal form of the company, uh, meaning that we can invest both in strictly try, at least try and invest in strictly non-profit companies, such as, for example, some companies that can come up from the capacity building measure, but also traditional profit companies or hybrid companies, such as new legal forms that have been establishing in recent years in Italy after a few changes in the legal frameworks. So for example, socially driven, uh, innovative socially driven startups legal form that is also incentivized by the government for investors to, to invest in their equity. So we have made, uh, uh, so this is actually a slide from last week. We had officialized uh, three investments, and now we have a new one. Uh, as you can see, these are social enterprises in Italy. I, I believe I can go deeper into this if you have questions later. So next slide, please. Okay, so this is the third uh, the third action within Carpo Social Innovation. It's called Get It. So uh, as you can imagine, it's not really uh, always easy. And uh, Luis also anticipated this in uh, his speech. It's not always easy to find uh, investment ready companies that are able to receive equity and start growing. But we also wanted to provide a full range of instruments to support uh, the, the growth or also the starting from scratch of new impact companies and, the, and get it is one of these. So if you can please go to the next slide, I can show you that uh, get it is a service providing platform uh, where we uh, try to uh, connect all the actors that are relevant and useful for the growth of new impact companies starting from the idea generation. So what we did here was to uh, con contractualize uh, 20 accelerators and incubators all over Italy. And we have uh, uh, created five call for impact where uh, new social entrepreneurs can uh, apply 
uh, and for, e for, each, uh, for each call, we will select up to 10 companies that will be able to access an incubation or acceleration program lasting three months uh, to be had at one of these incubators that the, the, the entrepreneur is able to choose uh, the one he wants to go in, uh, be it for geographical reason, but also for thematic region, uh, reasons. Because, for example, there are some more uh, some accelerators more focused on uh, food or uh, on environment or technology, as Luigi also said. Um, what, uh, what we ask here, it's interesting to point out, is that, well, of course, after the three, three months acceleration period, there is uh, um, a three-month mentorship period where the, the companies can also continue to have these, these services provided by professionals that they can choose within a network of mentors that we are building. Uh, and also, finally, the possibility either to enter the pipeline of Fondazione Social Venture, Giordano dell'Amore, if they become investment ready, or maybe to find some other investors within the network we are building in Italy. What we ask here is a, a, a call option on the 2% of the capital of the companies. And also we are able to, if they open a new uh, capital raising, uh, uh, within the incubation period, uh, we can match the, we can participate in the, in the capital raising with the discount on the valuation that the startup is, uh, is proposing to other investors. So meaning that we really are trying to follow the startup from the beginning of the idea to, to the moment that they are able to be invested by the other startups. The final slide of my, of my speech is about where we are now with the calls from Get It. As you can see, we had five calls. The first one was opened in March 2018. It was about welfare, health, and wellness. We received 97 applications, and we selected four startups that have, been, uh, that have finished their incubation or acceleration program in 2018. Uh, one of these is really, really promising. I'm really proud that uh, we have found them, <laughs> but I cannot tell you much more right now. Uh, then we had a accessible or sustainable tourism and cultural heritage call, which was uh, really good also with 100 applicants. And uh, the third one was closed just a few days ago about smart cities, mobility, food, and environment. And we achieved almost 140. Uh, applications, which is a really great result. We are screening them right now, and hopefully we will be able to select 10 good startups within April to start with the, with the acceleration programs. Um, I believe I'm done for, for now. So thank you for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Lorenzo, uh, for the fantastic work you're doing over there in Italy. It will be very interesting to see how this differs from Jessica's work. Jessica, I'm happy to pass over to you and learn about your view on acceleration at Beth and L Green Ventures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luis. Um, so, as mentioned in the intro, I'm Jessica Stacey, a venture partner at Beth and L Green Ventures. Um, so, if you could go to the next slide, um, for those of us that don't know Bethnal Green, Bethnal Green Ventures, our mission is to invest in and scale tech startups that are, are solving social and environmental problems. So we call these tech for good ventures. Um, and we're looking to support ventures that will significantly improve millions of lives, so have a huge scalable social impact, but also be financially profitable. So we're also looking to deliver a great return for investors. I've been asked to come here today and present BGB as a case study. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to cover a little bit about what we do, how we do it, um, and then also a bit about our history and how we were funded and, and got to where we are today. So the slide we're looking at right now, BGB at a glance, provides a bit of a, a snapshot of our investing activity to date. So since 2012, um, where we first got our own funding to invest directly in investors, in ventures, apologies. Um, we've delivered 13 accelerator programs and supported 113 startups through those accelerators. 
uh, we've deployed two and a half million pounds of investment capital into those startups. Uh, and our, our portfolio data uh, at present shows that we're, we're working at about 1.9x multiple of value to investment cost. So those, those ventures that are still active and uh, are doing well, there's about 60 active ventures in our portfolio, and they've gone on to raise a further 50 million pounds in investment um, from other investors. Uh, and we estimate that over 7 million beneficiaries uh, have uh, had a positive impact uh, from a Bethnal Green Ventures startup, and that's just in the last quarter alone. One of the other things we track when we're looking at a snapshot of our investment activity is the diversity uh, amongst our portfolio. Uh, and our, our portfolio companies record that they're about 37% of employees are female, which is about three times the, the tech industry average. So that, that gives you a quick snapshot to, to kick off with. Uh, this next slide, our approach, we'll talk a little bit more about actually what we do and how we do it. So twice a year, we run an open call for applications. Um, this follows the typical accelerator model that Luis explained in the introduction. Um, and what we look for when we are selecting for teams is, first of all, it has to have this tech for good focus. So we're looking to support ventures that are using technology to address major social and environmental issues. The other part is obviously we're looking for them to have a scalable business model. Um, so we're looking for ventures that have impact baked into their business model and have the potential for high growth and significant investment. Other evaluation and criteria that we look at when we're choosing startups is, you know, one, the innovation of the idea. So, um, you know, how innovative is this solution? You know, does it offer new and better ways of, of solving these problems rather than just digitalizing the status quo? And does it have that potential to scale? We're also looking at the team and doing an evaluation of the skill set in the team. Um, do they have the right experience uh, to, to develop this? Um, our preference is that we always work with teams rather than sole founders, although there are exceptional circumstances where we, we broke that rule. Um, and that's because we think teams are better equipped to cope with the, the pace of scale that we're looking for and that we want teams to have that sort of ambition for. Um, we also prefer that there's actually the tech skills within the team. So uh, a lot of the time on the accelerator, they'll be iterating on their prototype or MVP. Uh, and we can see that ventures are um, much better able to move quickly and rapidly iterate if they've got the, the tech skills in the team. And final, finally, diversity is, is really important when we're, we're evaluating the team. And this is because we think um, some of the most uh, interesting and um, successful solutions will come from people with actual lived experience of those social problems. Um, so we, we really value diversity of backgrounds and experiences when we're evaluating for the perfect startup team. Uh, when we're looking at the, the mix of companies that we want in each cohort, um, we look for a, a nice spread across the different impact themes. And this is because we want to have a diversified portfolio. So we, we work across, we call them four different impact themes. So the first is health. Uh, and here we're really interested in solutions that uh, open up access to, to health care, things that improve health outcomes for people, um, that do so in a way that decreases the cost of delivery so that it reduces inequality in the system and open up, opens up healthcare for all. Our second theme is education. Um, uh, similarly to healthcare, we're looking at um, new models or tools that can increase access to education, reduces the cost of education, and, and improves educational outcomes. Our third criteria, our third impact theme, is uh, around sustainability in the environment. Um, and we're really interested in new solutions to reduce waste, things around the circular economy, um, solutions around resource efficiency or cutting carbon emissions, for example. And finally, our, our fourth impact area is civic engagement. Um, and here we're, we're interested in uh, products or 
services that can help to improve democracy and improve civic engagement. So these are the four impact themes that we, we work across. Um, uh, the, the fourth uh, element that's really key to our approach is uh, how we find those startups to begin with, and this is the deal flow. Um, and, and we do this in a number of ways. So we have a, a mix of channels through to our referral network, word of mouth, marketing, but actually the most valuable source of deal flow is through the Tech for Good community that we've been building. Um, so for the last, actually, um, we've been building uh, a Tech for Good community through events that we run uh, and also through online communication channels. Uh, so we run a meetup in London called the Tech for Good meetup, uh, and that now has 8,000 members uh, and, and brings together hundreds of people every month who are interested in using technology for social change. Um, and that is actually a pipeline not only for interesting startup ideas and entrepreneurs, but also it's become a really important recruitment tool for mentors, investors, corporate partners, the kind of the whole ecosystem. And um, the, the last sort of segment here that we've got on the our approach, our approach slide is the portfolio support, which is the most important part of, of what we do. So following the application process that I, I touched on before, we will select around about 10 teams and take them through our intensive 12 week accelerator program. This includes office space, uh, investment. So we invest 20,000 pounds in every startup and that's at a standard investment office. So we take a 6% equity stake in each team. We run a, a series of workshops and, and business support sessions over that period. Uh, we connect the teams to investors and customers, and importantly, we also connect them to our mental network. So we have a, a network of about 90 active mentors, um, and without them, we really couldn't deliver the, the level of support that we do to both startups on the program, but also to the startups once they leave the program. Um, I think the kind of the key benefits of, of the accelerator model is really around the um, the peer support network that they get from being in the same space together, um, from being part of the alumni community. Uh, the investment allows them obviously to progress with their, their business, but also quite often they're at an early stage and this will be the, the, the kind of the capital that allows them to go full time on this and really give them the space to learn. And then connections to our, our network um, is also uh, an invaluable part of the resource and support that we offer. And the accelerator is really just the first stage of the lifelong support that we offer for ventures. So what happens after the three months is that a startup will be assigned a member of the BGB team who will monitor their progress and, and connect them with additional support. Um, and we, we do actually offer now some follow on investment. So for those teams that are performing well and they're on track with our model, we will do um, up to £50,000 at a pre-seed uh, level, so that's normally about six to 12 months out of the program, uh, and then we'll also co-invest up to 100 k at, at a seed round. We offer also non-financial support, so uh, just ongoing mentoring from BGV um, proves to be really valuable. Um, typically, this might take the, the format of fundraising coaching, for example. Um, or occasionally we will run uh, workshops or socials for alumni, uh, particularly if we spot that a number of our alumni teams are facing the same challenge. Um, we, we can be quite reactive and, and put on a sharing workshop for them to be able to learn from each other. Um, of course, this all sounds probably very resource intensive, um, and, and it is. <laughs> so that means we have to prioritize actually who we spend time with. So the BGB team is quite small. There's only nine of us. Um, we, we do rely heavily, like I said, on our mentor network, but we, we need to have a kind of data-driven approach to uh, inform actually how we prior prioritize the portfolio support. Uh, so every quarter, we ask all our startups to provide reporting on both business and, and social impact measures. Uh, and then based on the data that they provide to us, we can see which teams um, are 
performing well relative to their stage, relative to um, and and relative to our model. Uh, and what this means is that we prioritise the hands-on support to those that are performing well and still have the most potential to um, succeed from both a financial and an impact perspective. Um, and then for those teams that aren't quite on track that could still benefit from our help, um, they tend to be supported through less resource intensive means. So they get access to the alumni Slack channel, for example, the alumni email group, um, uh, access to community events. These are all things that we can deliver that actually don't take so much of the, the BGB team time. So that's a, a kind of a, an overview of what we do and, and how we do it. And um, before, before going to the next slide, I thought I might just mention a couple of the startups that we supported. The life, um, uh, the idea of you know who these startups are. Um, so, uh, one of these startups from our earliest cohort is called Doctor Doctor, um, and they've developed a hospital booking and administration system that helps hospitals deliver more effective care at lower cost. Um, uh, they're rolled out now, I think, across 20 plus hospitals um, throughout the UK and have been able to prove that actually hospitals that use their booking and administration systems um, have been able to be more effective in, in getting patients seen, which leads to a better experience um, and outcomes for the patients, but also um, uh, increased efficiency within the kind of healthcare system. Uh, a second startup is called Overleaf, and they work in the ed tech space. Um, they're essentially kind of Google Docs for scientific publishing, if you like. So they've created the world's leading platform for collaboration on scientific writing. Um, and they now have millions of users worldwide. So uh, the kind of growth and scale that they've been able to achieve is really impressive. Um, another venture we backed right from the early days uh, is Fairphone. So they've created the world's most ethical and sustainable mobile phone handset. Uh, and they're focusing on improving the welfare of workers and reducing the environmental impact um, from the, the kind of resources and production of the, the mobile phones themselves. Uh, so it's a snapshot of a few of the startups we've supported. Um, and now to kind of finish off, if I could go to the next slide, I thought it would be helpful to cover actually how we've been funded and where we've got to today. So our story actually goes back a little bit earlier than 2012. Um, it goes back to 2008, um, before I joined VGV, uh, where the team was running uh, essentially a hack events, like hackathons, uh, and it was called Social Innovation Camp. Um, and they were weekend events that brought together um, people with design and technology skills alongside people from the third sector that had a really strong understanding of um, really important social and environmental problems. And the idea was to create a community that could experiment and develop interesting ideas and new solutions for tackling these problems. Um, it, they worked really well and, and the team actually ran them, I think, in something like 30 countries around the world. Um, uh, but one of the main problems was, is after these hack events, everyone would just go back to their day job because there wasn't really the support system in place to be able to turn those ideas into a real business. Um, so then in 2011, um, uh, my colleague Paul Miller, uh, along, working alongside Nesta, the Innovation Foundation in UK, um, did a extensive research on the, the kind of accelerator model landscape evolving out of the, the US uh, and produced a report called the Startup Factories. Um, and what they did is they took the learning of the traditional accelerator model and thought about how they could apply it to social impact focused startups and piloted the first social impact tech accelerator in the UK in 2011. Uh, at that point, there was still no funding involved. It was a matter of bringing people together um, over a set period of time together with workshops, connections to mentors, connections to funders. And what they found is actually even without the investment involved at that very early prototype stage, um, some of the ideas went through that um, went on to be successful and um, one of them called the Good Gym is still very active and, and scaling across the UK today. So off the back of that um, we were able to access further funding to develop 
the full BGV Accelerator Programme that included investment alongside the co-working space and support. Um, and we accessed the funding for that through um, a variety of different partners. So we got funding from Nesta and Nominet Trust, so both charitable foundations based in the UK, interested in innovation um, uh, and social change. Um, and then we also benefited from a UK policy program called the uh, Social Incubator Fund. And the idea of this um, initiative was to fund, I think it was a 10 million pound fund um, to support up to 10 incubators across the UK um, with the idea of creating a pipeline for uh, impact funds down the line. So it was a, a match fund, so we matched our, our money with Nesta and Nominet Trust um, and we delivered, delivered the first full accelerator program in 2012. Um, so then over the next four Four years, we we continued to run the program, supported 80 ventures with that funding. Um, we also started doing post accelerator funding because we recognised very early on that there was this death valley after the accelerator program, um, and and we started, I guess, formalising a lot more our own structure and thinking about our own impact, uh, and we became a B Corp and a, a big supporter. Um, and to 2017, uh, the, the money from the Social Incubator Fund was coming to an end, uh, and we wanted to take all the learning from what we've done to date um, and continue to deliver the Accelerator program, but also expand on what we were doing. So our ambition now is to um, be able to support tech for good startups right from ideas through to idea stage onwards. Um, and so we were able to raise uh, 1.3 million, um, which was to grow our own capacity uh, to then be able to raise the, the BGV2 fund. And that money came from Big Society Capital, Nesta and Nominet Trust. Um, in the meantime, that we, you know, we've acknowledged that actually the acceleration model is very expensive to run. Um, so we did have to look at doing some other sort of consultancy work um, and sponsorship on the sides. So we've worked with, for example, the Mayor of London, Unilever, Facebook, uh, as well as a number of UK charities um, to uh, do sponsored programmes and innovation programmes uh, uh, alongside the accelerator model. And where we are today is we're hoping our will be so we're looking to invest in the next 100 startups that demonstrate significant positive impact for millions of people and great returns for investors. And we've also launched um, an SEIS and EIS fund for individual professional investors um, who want to take, who want to invest in tech for good and take advantage of some of the, the tax breaks in the UK that are available to startup investors. Um, and so that's the direction that we're headed in. Um, we're really excited about it and I, I look forward to taking any questions you might have about this um, in the Q&A. Thank you very much Jessica for sharing your experience. Let's now hear from Peter and his Norwegian experience. Hi everybody, uh, hope you're all doing well. So I'm Peter Lorang from the Catapult Accelerator. Um, you know, we're a global tech accelerator based out of Oslo, Norway. And kind of our main mission is just to build the world we want to live in. That's a pretty gnarly statement, but we really believe that, you know, every little piece counts. And that's sort of the, the grand view of the company. Um, so I think just if we move on to the next page, it's just a simple overview of kind of how we're structured. Uh, so we run a bi-yearly accelerator program. Um, we're super hands-on. We have 12 companies for three months in Oslo. Um, it's all residential, so companies come from all over the world to live and work next to each other here for three months. So we run two programs a year. Uh, you know, We run very hands-on mentorship through the team and our mentors. We have a thematic curriculum. Every week is different. And we open doors to every single kind of corporation and investors that we know. Uh, you know so, our team is kind of a combination of consultants, VCs, private equity experience, and some startup experience. 
And similar to the way that, you know, Jessica told, we have a pool of mentors as well that really help us. I think currently it's at about 250 mentors that, you know, do everything from growth hacking to corporate introductions or, you know, our investors and run mock investor meetings, kind of pushing the, pushing the companies hard to understand, you know, how it's out there when they go to the next stage. Uh, I think one of the biggest things, you know, that is our part of our program is taking equity and investing in the companies, kind of taking them to the next stage. Um, we invest 150,000 US dollars for 8%. And we also do targeted follow-on investments through our follow-on fund. Uh, generally, that's kind of allocated to the top 20% of the companies coming through our program as well. Um, one of kind of the, the big things that, that we focus on uh, when we look at the companies is what stage are they in and are they a company that can prove that they are kind of the, the next big thing. And for us to kind of evaluate that correctly, we always invest in companies that have a working product and that have traction. So that they are kind of past the revenue stage uh, of the company. If we move on to the next slide, I think kind of the big, the big idea behind uh, our accelerator is, you know, trying to solve all the global challenges. I think you guys, most of you have seen this before. This is the UN's SDG goals. Um, they're kind of all about the 17 problems in the world that we're trying to, to solve within the next 4,000 days. Uh, obviously, uh, that's kind of a crazy goal. And I think my, our MP did the math today earlier. And I think we're only, have, we're only at 3,954 days left. So, you know, time to get going. Um, I think this is also the basis of where we're from is that we're a for good and also for profit uh, accelerator. And if you look at the next page, you know, we believe that this is kind of the, the biggest investment opportunity of, uh, of all time that, you know, solving the largest problems in the world, whether they're, you know, environmental or social or any kind of humane problem should also be the big opportunities. And we strongly believe that an alignment between doing good and making money is is good for us, it's good for investors, and it's good for the planet. So we think they're not mutually exclusive at all, although you know that may not have been how investors have looked at this before. Uh, just so you understand kind of how we work and what's special about our program, in our minds at least, is if you go to the next page to sort of our deal flow, where does it come from? How do we actually get to the companies that come into our accelerator? So our kind of crazy numbers is that we've had for the first three programs that we run had 4,000 candidate companies. So about 1,500 times two and then 1,800 for our last, com uh, our last batch were from 110 countries and only 35 companies have been accepted so far. So our acceptance rate as of today is about 0.9%. And you know, just as comparisons, uh, not really kind of apples for apples, but Harvard has a 5.8 acceptance rate and Y Combinator, which is probably the most famous accelerator of all, has a 1.5 acceptance rate. So I think the good part about this that we see is that there are many, many opportunities out there uh, for impact companies. And there are way many more companies that we ever kind of dreamed would exist within our little niche, which is impact investing, right? So I think one of the, the biggest things we do if we move on onto the next slide is how we actually select our companies. So this next batch that starts in a week and a half, we have 1,800 companies that we chose from. And uh, it's just an enormous number. So half, about half of those are applicants. And similar to what Jessica and BGV said is that, you know, we have your big network. We actively uh, look for companies that we believe are a good match and are also with the same mission alignment on trying to solve the biggest problems. So how we really work is that we screen 1,800 companies do they have the, which are kind of the best impact, which are solving the biggest problems, who are using technology that's scalable and that, you know, can be used exponentially. Uh, so what we do is we go from 1800 companies to 150 that we interview every single of those companies, trying to figure out what's the best team, who has traction, who has the best tech, who actually has a product in the market before we move on to second round interviews with about 50. And then we start our actual DD process before we end up with about 12 companies. So this process is something that we've built past the, over the past two years and really kind of professionalized and put into a system that you know creates value to our investors and means that we select the best companies that we have available to us at all times. 
So I think if you go to the next slide, you can see that out of the 35 companies, we have companies from 22 different countries. And I think very important to us is that, you know, if you're trying to solve global problems, uh, most of them aren't happening in Oslo or in Norway. So we really believe that if you're trying to solve these problems, you need to solve them where the problems actually exist. And that's one of the most important reasons that we look for global companies is that, or companies anywhere in the world is simply that we can't solve everything, you know, from some, from little Scandinavia, if you will. Um, also as kind of similar to, to Jessica, we're looking for female founders because we believe a balanced team is super important to succeed. Uh, currently we have, you know, at least 40% female co-founders in our portfolio companies. And we still don't believe that's good enough quite yet. We, we always, we're always looking to improve and we believe it should be higher. And, you know, we're actively looking to, to find teams that have a balanced, a balanced employee pool, which I think is really important to us. Uh, if we move on to, on to the next slide, we, um, this is kind of our current portfolio and as of now, we're, in our opinion, covering seven global megatrends. Uh, at the top, you see, um, you know, mostly planet-based trends where you have either clean tech or renewables, where you're trying to solve kind of energy, uh, energy-related problems, uh, smart city and green city and mo mobility. How do we actually, how we can help kind of the planet do that? And we also have, you know, resource utilization, mostly in, in agriculture or agri-tech uh, companies. Uh, at the bottom, you have kind of our portfolio companies, which are humane based, if you will, um, you know, either solving, you know, access to medicine, uh, you know, one of our companies solves, you know, dementia for elderly through reminiscence therapies. We have ed tech, uh, financial inclusion that mostly relates, you know, to, to Asia, North America or North, <laughs> South America and Africa. And then we have a section called development and sustainability, which, you know, you know, helps refugees or helps where there's been a humanitarian crisis or a natural disaster. Uh, I think if you move to the next page, I think one of the, the main thing behind all of this is that, yes, we are a fund, we're for profit and for good at the same time. And uh, just sort of the, the learnings that we've had in the past couple of years is that it's great that there's so many fantastic companies out there trying to solve the biggest companies. And it's good that investors are opening their eyes but we're still seeing that it's not happening fast enough, uh, you know, for a multitude of reasons. Uh, there are other ways that maybe there may be simpler ways to make money. Uh, so for the investors, you know, it may not be kind of the, the most natural route to go. And politically, you know, there are barriers to doing impact investing and, you know, seeing the, the direct correlation between doing something good and doing returns or gaining returns for investors. And I think, you know, in a long-term view, that's really our main goal and something that we strive for every single day is making, you know, the continued growth of returns because that's what's going to drive the development behind all this. And particularly if you can't provide sustained returns for investors, they aren't going to keep in investing in impact. You know, sometimes that's kind of the, the critical way to look at investors is that some are just, you know, throwing money at something good, sort of, you know, the Bill Gates Foundation, where you're throwing, just throwing money at, or at a problem. But I think, you know, for the sustained success of impact investing, there needs to be proven results. And that's sort of where, where we are today, where we've only, you know, we did our first investments only 18 months ago, but we're already seeing, you know, an unrealized IRR of 65% for that, for that fund. And, you know, our portfolio has grown 2.6 times since, you know, uh, since then. And then, you know, some of those investments were even done six months ago. So the initial numbers are amazing, but we really, really need to prove us, you know, and everyone else doing impact investing needs to prove that this is something that's valuable and is going to, you know, give significant returns to the investors. So that is really, you know, coming from the investment team of Catapult. That's how we see that this is going to grow and, you know, going to be completely mainstream to do impact investing. And that's really, I think, where our focus area is to, is to, is to prove that this is something that's worth doing and that, you know, doing good is also going to do good for your wallet. So. I think that's really all I want to say. I'm super excited to answer any questions. So, you know, please, uh, please get them in and uh, hope this was at least a little bit interesting to, to listen to and that you guys agree with, uh, with sort of our main thesis. Thank you. We do have um, lots of questions coming in on different topics, some more on 
whether there's an actual future of accelerators. Is it being threatened by you know massive online open courses? Is it is it really adding enough value? Other more on what is the selection criteria for impact? How do you in advance try to understand if a venture has the impact angle or not? Others on the curriculum that it usually is offered. I would like to start um, to make sure we cover this more on the policy angle here. So what I would suggest is I would like to go around, you know, starting by Jessica, then Lorenzo, then Peter. Uh, just try in, you know, maybe a couple of minutes to what is your perspective on the role of policy here? Uh, there should be policy initiatives aimed at promoting incubators and accelerators. Uh, is it enough? Uh, should we have more? It should be completely different. So kind of an open question, but I, I wanted to hear from your experience, uh, what is the, um, uh, the role of, of policy here? So I'm not going to claim to be a policy expert, um, but I'll, I'll give an answer here. And, and obviously, as I mentioned, Bethany Green Ventures we benefited from from public money from the the cabinet office social incubator fund um so being in an accelerator it's very easy to sit here and say <laughs> like yes more money would be would be great um i was looking back i was actually involved at well at nesta in a report called good incubation and we made some recommendations back then so that was 20 2014. Um, and i think that's some the recommendations you made then still apply and um, so first of all it was understanding that the UK social incubator fund um, it, it was sort of a blanket funding for all different types of, of social ventures and if you're kind of thinking about the accelerator model um, I think it only really works for those like sort of high growth um, ambitious teams um, and uh, I guess I'm like looking at other programs I think when they've tried to support sort of both that kind of high growth venture model plus more um uh i guess other types of social enterprises they, they haven't worked so well so um the key point there is to design policy programs um around these different types of social organizations differently um another uh sort of policy initiative to, from that was to develop a better understanding of the business models for incubation so we know with BGV, our equity-based model will take time to prove. Um, and I think that we got funding to, to do our various bits of activity kind of in tranches over time. Um, and I think if, if these types of programs are going to be receiving enough funding to do well, they have enough funding to do well. They have enough funding to do well. We had some connection problems, so I want to make sure the question is clear. And maybe Jessica, you could try to wrap it up in in a minute. What was your answer? So we are to hear the perspective from our speakers on the policy angle. Should we have incentives for this? How should they be? Are they enough, or do we need something different? So Jessica, maybe I understand the sound was not mm -hmm. raised for the last couple of minutes. So maybe if you can try and summarize your perspective mm -hmm. again, it would be great. Thank sure. you. Um, I'll try to do that more more briefly. So I was trying to make a point about, you know, we we benefited from policy initiatives that have seen sort of co-funding or, or direct funding to accelerator programs. Um, but I think that if these kind of things are going to take place in future they have to um, maybe do more research or really understand the long-term model for these programs and make sure that they capitalize them uh, effectively um, another kind of policy initiative that we think could be interesting is uh, anything that they could do to support um, the, the post-incubation gap and encourage um, more uh, for social ventures. Uh, and then the kind of third area, 
would be quite interesting for, uh, I'm not sure if it's for the whole, um, but it's just to help us better and um, and um, without wanting to make it too complicated, sort of if there was a way of simplifying impact metrics across the board, then that might make it easier for both startups and investors to be able to compare different models and programs. I'll, I'll finish off there and hand over to the other speakers to, to input their policy thoughts. Yes, Lorenzo, if you could share with us, what's your view on this policy angle? Okay, so uh, right now, uh, what I'm, uh, what we are experiencing in Italy is a bit of a paradox because, of course, the accelerators and incubators needs to be paid for their precious services. But the point is, very often the startups don't really have any cash to pay this. So what we what we try to do, we get it. Uh, what we are noticing is that. Uh, Accelerators, of course, need to be paid for the precious services they provide. On the other hand, typically startups don't uh, really have much cash to pay for this. Maybe they don't even have revenues if we are talking to startups who are being incubated. So, I mean, uh, right now, not much is being uh, done on the policy side on this. And what, on my personal point of view, would be useful is to find uh, some kind of, I don't know, seed instrument to provide the initial capital where it's really hard for startups to, to raise. So very, in the very initial phases, so that startups would be able to, you know, uh, kick off and start the acceleration program. Otherwise, what we are experiencing right now in Italy is that uh, either the, the acceleration accelerators need to you know take big chunks of uh, equity from the startups in order to you know cash in later and so be sustainable themselves or on the other hand uh, we have like uh, non-profit players such as the fondazione social venture di Orlando dell'amore that provide grants to startups in order for them to pay for their own acceleration acceleration programs so really uh, a seed instrument would be I don't know, I see it as a key, key issue here. So also, for example, uh, I know a bit about the UK case study and uh, it was much more, uh, you know, policy driven with the whole big society capital uh, instrument while in Italy we don't have anything like that. And I believe uh, it would be really useful to have, you know, a source of funding at the centralized level to foster the growth of this ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Very interesting. Peter, I would be very curious to hear your perspective as well on the policy angle. Yeah, I, I think I'll be relatively quick on this as I, uh, like Jessica, I'm not a, a policy expert. I think it, it depends whether you think that necessarily the, the policy should be geared towards the accelerators or the incubators or the companies themselves or both. And I think I don't know if the best result is necessarily that you're going to create, you know, specific policy for an accelerator or an incubator that to me that seems relatively far-fetched uh, to be quite honest but i know that especially in norway and and sweden as well the kind of the innovate local government does a lot of innovation grants which really is fueling kind of the, the willingness to start companies uh, and i think that's more important because to i think the main goal here with impact investing is creating something that's worth more than just the dollars coming out and to do that, you need the companies. Uh, that's sort of the, the the foundation of all of this. And I think that is the key element more than trying to create, you know, a financial incentive other than you know returns for the incubator or or accelerators by policy at, at the very least. Thank you, Peter. I'll you know I'll just take advantage that uh, you're there and ask you. Um, I think a thought provoking question that we that we had from from Piotr Drodz. So what Piotr is trying to say is, do accelerators really have a future? You know, with, with the rise of massive open online courses, you know, with all the challenges that we see around 
uh, around the equity business model in which we, you, it takes a long time for you to sell your stake on the company and in the meanwhile there's a lot to you know uh, to fund in terms of the cost structure you know uh, of the of all the programs only the top three and five could be claimed are having access to the most promising startups so in a nutshell how do you see the future of accelerators is there a future is it threatened uh, sure um... Well, in terms of that, I think as a as a fund, we have a very long term perspective, um, and I think a lot of our companies, specifically, you know, are are longer term and are generally B two B. I understand that with everything being online, that you can do many things, you know, strictly B two C by just putting it out on the uh, on you know the app store or whatnot. But I think a lot of what we do is organizational structure, helping people, you know, connecting with people. I think there's so much of this is that it's humane. And actually doing business isn't necessarily just putting something on, uh, on the internet and it's just going to blow up. I don't think that's you know completely realistic, particularly if you're trying to do the things that our companies or you know I guess for that uh, relates to both Lorenzo and Jessica as well, is that you can't just put something on the internet and expect it to to just go boom overnight. You know the Facebooks of the world are you know the exception, not the rule. There's so many other things that. That an accelerator provides in terms of you know human growth and company growth and organizational structure and investor readiness. I just think that it's that isn't going to come by taking online courses. In my opinion, obviously that's you know someone else may say, oh, I can find everything online, but I don't think this is you know necessarily the case for for building a company. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. I will you know Jessica. I would ask. Uh, like to ask you to compliment Piotr on this question uh, on the future of accelerators as well as putting another one on the table that we had coming in, which is how do you select uh, ventures for impact? You know, how do we know there are impact? We follow any specific frameworks or, you know, how do we do it? Sure. Um, I, I agree with, with Pedder. I don't think MOOCs or, or online courses will ever replace the um, kind of physical face-to-face -face model. And actually, we, we experimented with BGV doing a slightly virtual program once. Um, and this is because normally we have a requirement that teams come in a, a based in London with us during the program and we wanted to be a bit more accessible to people outside of London um, and the teams that weren't physically in the space with us at the end of it um, they reported back that they didn't get as many benefits from the both the course content that we deliver but also from the networks and the kind of peer-to-peer -peer environment um, uh, so yeah agreement there um, in terms of the selection criteria question I think this was around how we select for social impact and compare social impact criteria across the different teams um, to be honest we are quite um, uh, I, I don't know if loose is the right word but we we don't expect really rigorous social impact reporting when we're talking about early stage startups especially when we're, we're talking to teams when they're they're just beyond the idea stage um, so we, you know we're not expecting them to have a full theory of change or, or anything like that but what we do look for is that the the founders have a, a really strong understanding of the problem um, either through their kind of own personal or, or industry experience um, uh, and we, we value that really highly because we know that the solution will probably change um, and once they're, all, they're on the program and they, they sort of start getting input and feedback from users um, but if they are you know have a deep knowledge of the problem and are deeply motivated to, to change it then we, we're confident that they will regardless of the solution changing they will be continuing to, to work and address that, that social impact issue. Um, we also really value um, that kind of design user-led approach. Um, so to see that, you know, a team when they, they come to us and we're, we're interviewing them, they might at that point, they might have a product or they might even just have some kind of paper prototypes. But what we want to see is that they put these in front of users and have been open and responsive to the feedback. Um, and this is because we think that um, in order to have effective products or services that are really going to address social needs in a, in a way that kind of 
um, is accessible to, to kind of large audiences, then the the beneficiaries um, of these solutions need to be involved in the design process. Um, so kind of by looking out for these things, we it helps to build our confidence that the way that the startup is developed will will have the kind of the long term social impact that we're looking for. Um, what that means is it is actually quite hard to compare uh, across different startups if we don't have, you know, really rigorous impact measures at the early stage. Um, and this means that we we kind of take it on a startup by startup basis, to be honest. Um, so I hope that ad addresses the the question on, on terms of how we think about social impact on the selection phase. Um, and then going forward, when we're kind of reporting and helping teams on social impact, um, we think it's really important that actually that the teams should be coming up with what is the most um, important and relevant impact measures. We can help to guide them, but you know they're the ones with the most knowledge about the, the issue and the business. So they, they should be coming up with the impact criteria. And ideally, it should be baked into their, their business metrics that, we're, that they will be tracking. Um, so our preference are, are models where you know, their impact is integral to their business, so purely by selling one more of what they're doing, they will be impacting more lives. So therefore, you know, tracking customer growth and user growth actually is a, a proxy for, for social impact measures as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. Lorenzo. I think if I may, if yeah. I, may I just jump in and say, so one of the very first things that we do uh, when we know at the beginning of our accelerator is basically saying, you know, clearly revenue is always the goal, but what's the underlying kind of driver of that? And I think, you know, 90, 99 out of 100 times with especially us, that's always some sort of impact baked into that, the underlying driver. So it's, it isn't very hard to see, you know, how, as Jessica states, if they sell one more of their product or if, you know, they get one more customer, that is going to drive the impact. So I think that's, it's super clear most of the time. And that's our number one criteria when we look at companies is that can we argue that this is something that's good for the world? And if we can, and it usually is, I think, and I think most of the founders of these companies are very specific about kind of the mission of their company. And that's why it's never really been an issue to, to argue that they're impact companies. Thank you. Let me add to that, you know, as a moderator, I'm trying to contain myself, but it's impossible. I think this is a really interesting question. And, uh, sharing our experience here, the conclusion we got to is that trying to be overly define what is impact is pointless. And one of the best ways to picture this is to um, is a citation of Sant'Agostini, which said at some point, everyone knows what time is until you try to start defining it. And, you know, this is a little bit what happens with impact we we kind of know it when we see it sometimes we try to be you know more uh, scientific about it but it's not like black and white so moving on to uh, another question there's a, a very interesting question here from Murray Gray Lorenzo uh, Murray is asking if you had to share three of your biggest learnings with those wanting to develop impact incubators and accelerators what would these learnings be? So three biggest learnings. Okay, so this is a very ambitious question. <laughs> I have to think about this. So three learnings from the from starting an acceleration. Okay, so the first learning, I believe, uh, I can try to throw out there, is that the incubator or acceleration per, accelerator per se is not probably enough to, to have... Uh, uh, a new a new company new startup right? because uh, and this is also the the added value of an incubator related to for example an online course is that uh, you get to meet uh, also potential partners in business you get to meet uh, a potential network of investors professionals and also other people like you that are trying to to create their company so i believe that uh, trying to put all the pieces together is the first thing that comes to my mind as really important. Uh, secondly, uh, I believe having a strong and motivated team uh, because uh, 
I don't know. I don't know about the other international experience, but I believe in Italy, an, incub an incubator on acceleration is not really the most profitable business. So the team must really, really believe in what they are doing, and they also can do, you know, great things. Uh, it's also an amazing job to do this. But uh, I, it's it's not always easy for people coming from the from the strictly profit sector to grasp what it means to work, so, to work in a social uh, social impact accelerator. Uh, the third insight uh, is probably uh, I believe that starting to reason in uh, not only uh, setting up an accelerator but also setting up uh, a supply of capital is also probably probably a good idea because it's all uh, really really connected. I hope Thank this you, was Luke. a good answer. <laughs> So I know it's not an easy question, and that's exactly why I'm asking Piotr to try to answer it as well. Piotr, I would like you to share what are the three um, key learnings uh, you would share with those starting to uh, create a, an accelerator uh, from scratch. And I will add another question here for you to keep in mind to answer afterwards, which is, what do you think that could be done for more collaboration between different national, regional accelerations, you know, resource sharing, et cetera? Well, that's a pretty big question. Uh, I guess if we start at the beginning, I think just, you know, in terms of creating an accelerator, I'm assuming that we're all talking about effect accelerator, accelerators here anyways, but I think the main thing is that you need to find out, you know, if you're, how broad or how you know niche you're going to be because we get kind of suggestions or proposals from in the, from you know potential partners all the time do you want to do you know an agritech uh, start uh, accelerator do you want to do you know a health tech accelerator and i think you have to be specific about what you're trying to solve i think that's basically number one uh, number two you need you know you need to have you know funds to do this you need money for to run all this and so you either need to find, you know, any grants or anything such as you guys have spoken about, or you need investors who are aligned with what you're trying to do with your mission, you know, which kind of relates back to my first point. And I think you need to be, you need to be super hands-on and you need to be willing to learn the whole time because every different, every company coming in is going to be different and they need to, the operational part of it is so much more kind of all consuming that you can kind of, than you can imagine. Um, I think that is my kind of big three things, and it, but it also helps, you know, when you're if you're doing something for good, you it's easier to get your foot in many doors than, you know, if you're simply another person trying to to get, to provide returns because then the competition is even heavier. So I think that's sort of the the bonus, uh, the upside of that. Thank you, Piotr. Um... And re regarding the, you know, all the sharing, what do you think could be, you know, the where are the biggest opportunities there between different think, acceleration, you know, yeah, regional, so, national, you know? So we try to we try to be very open and transparent with everyone. Obviously, we have competitors uh, as everyone else, but I think mostly with with sharing, we we try to set up, you know. Uh, kind of uh, if we're an umbrella we try to set up you know under under our umbrella different accelerators in different regions focusing on something that's not exactly the same as us you know it could be feeder accelerators or it could be you know the follow-on fund which is sort of the other end and I think in terms of collaborating we we do a lot with anyone who's basically not you know a direct competitor where we get you know we get some sort of synergy from them and they get a synergy from us particularly if they if they're an earlier stage, you know, an incubator, we we try to be okay. This is obviously beneficial for us if we can get deal flow deal flow from them, but also it's super beneficial for them if you know their companies are picked up by us or other uh, similar similar accelerators. I think there is you know a very positive vibe I think and a positive attitude in uh, within accelerators and kind of the the startup <laughs> environment where you're always trying to help each other, and I think that's that's kind of a prerequisite for, for partnering. I don't want to get into too many specifics with, you know, how you partner or, but I think being transparent and 
kind of helping to open doors is the most important thing because I think that's where, you know, just getting your foot in the door is such a big deal, uh, especially for the companies in the accelerator. And I think that's kind of the the, the major thing, uh, at least in my opinion. If you know, if other, others have other views, please please feel free to share as well. Jessica, I I think this is a great question. It's going it's worth going all around. What do you think? Sure. So this is um, around the the regional and national sharing between yeah. accelerator programs. Um, I think a response very similar to, to Peter at, at, at Catapult, you know, um, at BGB, we, we try to be very open and transparent about our approach and, and often host um, delegations from other countries who want to learn about how, uh, the way we we do our model um, and share best learning. Um, and that all seems very, very lovely. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, we do acknowledge that um, with certain programs we are in competition that's that's the truth of it and so I think if you were going to have a kind of successful sharing ecosystem and it has to be with kind of complementary programs that um you know either at different stages different verticals um and I, I guess some of the kind of things you could have there were, were shared learning when I was back at Nesta we ran an event where we we got a bunch of accelerator managers together um, and actually because there tends to be just a few programs in each country or town it's not often actually that the people running these programs get together and 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 share their experience and and everyone got a lot of value from that um, I haven't thought about this this particular suggestion in detail but I, was, I just the idea popped to my head you can imagine you know if there was a comp complementary programs you could have kind of exchanges between startups and that would be a really interesting way of exploring whether um, sort of products are, are ready to enter new markets and that that's one idea for kind of shared learning shared value yeah thank you thank you very much Jessica so uh, let's let's go around with one more question we are approaching our um, the end so Lorenzo, I have a question here from Thomas Bidsbal. So he, he mentions in a very fair way that all the talk is around on the demand side, you know, on impact ventures. But what about the investors? You know, are investors impact ready? Could we all argue that the lack of pipeline is also a function of investors? Uh, let's say inability to find good investments so in other words i would like to ask Lorenz, what what do you think um that investors could do better to help promote this ecosystem of impact ventures you know particularly within the role of accelerators and 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 in, and incub and incubators Hey, thank you. So this is, I believe, actually easier than the previous question. <laughs> so I consider myself lucky. Uh, okay, so uh, I can tell you a bit more right now in Italy, and you are actually making a good point with this question, because uh, what we have been experiencing in the last few months, or even last couple of years, is that many supposed impact investors talk about what impact when they try to do it, they don't really have a real clear idea. Uh, so, I mean, uh, defining a strategy, de defining a framework, defining a process is all part of, uh, of, the, of the key aspects of setting up an impact fund. And it's not actually easy because uh, it involves uh, several grades of complexity because it's not only about uh, finance it's not only about venture capital or private equity but it's also about uh, uh, understanding what are the needs of the company and specifically a company that wants to achieve a, a social impact so uh, what uh, investors could try to do is really uh, i don't know there should be uh, the demand and supply side of the partner of the market trying to uh, come together and put themselves in the shoes of the other and see if there is a match there because uh, I don't know basically the some sometimes the entrepreneur really uh, is doesn't really not always is able to get what are the the main drivers of uh, 
an impact fund strategy and vice versa the the financial analysts don't really it's not always easy to grasp what the what the mission what the final goal of the entrepreneur is so it's uh, it's really about uh, creating a partnership like when you do the due diligence process you re you really need to 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 understand who you are talking to and what are the needs what is the the business plan like what uh, what are the main drivers of the of the financial sustainability and also of the impact and this uh, this is a long process uh, it's, it's not easy uh, our due diligence take a lot of time an entrepreneur for the first time, it takes us on average, I believe, almost one year before we are able to uh, to be convinced to invest because it's uh, it's a long process. So getting to know each other in a very deep way is probably the, the first step. Thank you, Lorenzo. Uh, Piodor, two things we as investors could do better. Two things. Two things that we can do better. I think I think this is kind of a, back to the the last part of my my presentation is you know actually proving that impact investing is is providing a sustainable and good return. I think that's number one, and I think number two is the thing that everyone speaks about that we have no clear goal on it is impact measurement and how do you define it and how do you specify it. I don't have the answer, but I think that's one thing that we can be better at is actually, you know, providing key metrics that are that are good for impact measurement uh, I think those are my quick answers to that i you know i don't want to get into a really long uh really i think that's the most important thing to be honest without going into too much detail on that this could be a webinar in and in mm -hmm. itself jessica last word from you one thing as investors we could do better mm -hmm. um i think as the the other two speakers kind of touched on what I guess what like individual equity based investors could do better. I thought I would might actually talk about um, grant funding and um, sort of traditional charitable funders because we find that they still play a really important role for a lot of the social ventures that that we support in the early stages. Um, however, a lot of the, the teams we find when they're applying for, for some of the grants um, are excluded because of their for profit approach. Um, so I think the questions was, you know, are investors impact ready? Uh, I kind of flip that and are, are grant funders business ready? Can they kind of see that impact and, and business models can go hand in hand um, and, and be a bit more flexible in their funding approaches? Because I think there is still a real need sometimes for grant funding, um, certainly in the very early stages. Thank you very much, Jessica. So we, we got to the end of the webinar. Uh, it's only left for me to appreciate once again your availability to discuss these subjects. Thank you again, Lorenzo, Jessica, Peter, thank you all. I would like also to thank you all of the participants for tuning in and raising your questions. I'm really sorry we could not get to all, to all the questions. A gentle reminder that the recording of this webinar will be available on EVPA's website soon. Uh, and we do appreciate you taking a moment to tell us what you think about this, the future webinars uh, that could potentially be done next. Should you have any questions about the webinar or a policy related matter, don't hesitate to send us an email. We also be publishing a written note on the topic, so stay tuned. On behalf of the VPA policy team, thank you very much for your time and hope you to see in future webinars.